We're so excited to have you here. We're so excited to be back, open to the public. Um, this is this is really fun. I was going to say a bunch of really moving, profound stuff tonight about this senior class, but that's going to be saved for celebration with you tonight. Um, so be prepared. Be prepared. We all we all going to cry. It's going to be very sad and moving. <laughs> Um, tonight, this is going to be fun. You guys are in for a treat. Um, I have up here a bunch of bios. <laughs> litmus, we were hoping to have Litmus, our literary journal in today. It's not in, but I have the bios from Litmus that the students have written themselves, and I get to read them tonight. It's like my favorite night. Um, so, so that's what we're doing tonight. Um, Sit back, enjoy yourself. Ah, yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> I'm Alan, I am the chair of the creative writing department. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, you know, one other bit of business. Could you silence your cell phones for, for us? Um, you can maybe take a picture or something of your student reading or your friend reading or whatever, but um, no flashes, that could be really distracting. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for silencing. UJ, you come on yeah. down. <laughs> South Carolina, but insists but insist you know they're also from West by God, Virginia. Their work has been recognized by Scholastic's Art and Writing Awards and the handful of enigmatic artsy friends they chase around for advice. If you are looking for them, you should probably check by an open window where they're creating another portrait of a friend, re-watching American Psycho for the 13th time. That seems like a bad combination, like 13 in America. Or tucked up in bed playing Minecraft, their goals for the future include learning how to flambe, that's dangerous, getting married in an Elvis themed wedding chapel, or being better and being better than George Saunders, everyone all the long <laughs> Sweetness or arch, 
stretch, bring her arms back to embrace a breast arm stretch. Now we have 11 a.m. by Everett Hopper. What's there to grieve for? Surely not the birds. Is the fine trembling of the trees this time of year to think we've almost missed it, to think this breath of jasmine will come again and again and again, to think of late entries and dense paper cuts and the shrill hum of panic in a cold, wet body. When it was seven, there was an ancient man named Otsi in National Geographic. His body was leather bones on the side of a mountain. They say he climbed frantic. All we ever need is rest. Who doesn't love a good snowbank, blue and plush? I remember the night we napped sweatlessly with a fluorescent on. I remember the night we watched a May storm eat the oats outside the window till they bowed. This was the place with the plush armchairs and the wide windowsill to play with our shoes, falling asleep as the flowers bled yellow on the ground. Um, and my last poem, it's actually not about a painting. It is my introductory poem. I had set up this idea of like a fake art museum because if there's anything I love more than um, writing fundamental poetry, it's lying to people that I don't know. <laughs> so, the title is Galleria. I may look back on this and say, oh, how unnavigable. And you may be sitting on the bench outside the west entrance and say, well, Stella, that's how these archaic things are. But if I was a frog tomorrow, and some tween-aged biologists opened me right there on a cold steel tray, I don't know what warm things they would find. My soft limestone innards, some poorly lit passages, and all paint, just paint, other than a shiny, uh, other than a handful of shiny gray freebie that I could so quickly make a joke or two for if I was not dead. How memorial. Maybe I still am croaking. Maybe there is a you and a me, pretty and pea-coated in the dark squeak of our shoes in a hardwooded hall. And I am explaining to you some canvas thing that feathered the back of the throat with the smell of a resin seal. And then finally, after the plastic skies and the plastic Roman baths and the plastic Japanese tea gardens, we are bored. No thesis or plaque is here, not for some esophageal staircase, just the barge boats suspended heavily in this lead gray river and the cold breath against this tunnel refrain. Maybe there is a nest there. Maybe we can pick out the specks on some blue eggs like favorite freckles. And we wake and we fall asleep and we dream inside this limestone head. And then after all the scheming and map marking and losing, the kettle line at the train break reels us home. Thank you. person who never stops laughing at a corny joke and two hours later thinks about the fact that they totally embarrassed themselves in that moment and laughs about it again for a longer amount of time. Yeah, that's UJ Daniels. <laughs> and that's all UJ's bio says, but I'm going to add, she's an American Voices Medal winner. Um, she's a semifinalist for Young Art. She had a gold part portfolio for Scholastics. UJ Daniels, come on. Yeah! Welcome to the Sugar Shack. After the painting, Sugar Shack by Ernie Mung. Welcome to the Sugar Shack, full of dusty, aching men, shades of burnt sienna, auburn, and copper from working in the mine. They look for good times, gyrating towards deep, curved cystus, bodacious and vibrant, their perky coconut breasts and blush nut brown faces held towards the few day moon lights swinging above their flawless skin as they jazz and sway, wearing rusty tomato reds, saffron yellows, and deep indigo blues sewn on brakes, the fine cotton fabric from textile machines, mills needing their woman's touch for 16 hours, only to come here and lindy hop, spinning into the arms of their men like thick wool fibers, stumping their pearl white mule heels against the creaky chestnut wooden floors, shine and polish just for Big Daddy Rucker's arrival, 
singing away to read past the third shift worries, heavy leather boots echoing the rhythm of the blues, their dust clogged lungs plunged and cleansed by the smooth bass of the tenor saxophone, the velvet pitched notes of the battered acoustic guitar strummed by an old soul reaching his last note, a trumpet scatting along with Big Daddy Rucker, and one drum following the heartbeats of beat down workers, their eyes shut floating above the smoke stained roofs with the B flats and F sharp keeping their heads above water, grinding against the sweet smell of cocoa buttercup coated sisters just before their next shift, women weaving yarn and webs of thread, sweat and heated spindle oil, while men cramped between walls of trembling coal-infested rocks, rocking and squeezing and kissing and hugging, rubbing onto their smooth arms like abraded igneous rocks, sharing golden sugarcane rum spilling over the rims of their mason jars tasting the thick molasses joy of the sugar shack. My next piece is a nonfiction piece titled The Lovely Red Skirt. It was the first time I had wrote a poem and so it kind of got changed into prose, so here I go. The Lovely Red Skirt. Red isn't my favorite color. Jezebels wear red, the church mother said. Forced to wear Pentecostal approved skirts swiping against my ankles with thoughts of having them mangled with every weighted stride my skin sewn up into dusky gray cotton fabric. I chose to comply to a lie that my body has to be adorned in modesty to make the creator of the same body give me access to everlasting life. To please my flesh cleansed of rebellion, I admire the stolen skirt from the back of my closet. It's short, scarlet red, velvet smooth, feisty and taboo like the discovery of this hidden treasure amongst the heavy duty trash bag of clothes known as acceptable apparel, given as gifts to the huge black family of seven with an unemployed father, a diversity visa lottery immigrant failing. Nonetheless, I take it for the purpose of hope, shove it into my basket two hours before my mom under his instruction, snuff and filter it out from the oldest to youngest selection process of scavenging through piles of stained new garments. One day I'll be able to wear it. In fact, I do. Sneak it into my textbook stuffed backpack, fold it nicely so it won't wrinkle, rush to the bus and sit in the front seat like I usually do, head resting on the cold, dewy window pane and pain, hearing the laughter of the stylish, popular girls being passed love letters like church tracks on a scorching Sunday afternoon. My song of Solomon's to myself, smeared along with the Vaseline sup from the side of my right cheek. And when we arrive, I run to the bathroom after getting off the bus. I go into the smallest stall. I need to go into the big accessible one. She's morbidly obese, my doctor whispered into my mother's ear. Those words stung but still. I squeeze off the decoy, my thighs spilling over like the unraveling seam, screaming with every slight rip, stretch. And I carefully take out the lovely red skirt, place it on my body, climbing up my hips with ease, a perfect fit. Shocks my body with confidence, finally comfortable in my own skin while despising it. Forgot about how I felt. The red skirt cinched my waist, insinuated my overdeveloped curves, okay with being locked outside the gates of heaven. If only I could live out this last lustful day, for I desire myself in this moment. But not for long. I strut to class with a tight backpack. My chin and head tilted up, approaching my cubby. The teacher gasps in horror, sprints to the entrance of the door, clutches my wrist before I could get any further, yanks me, pulls me. I sit outside the principal's office, listening to her expert opinion on what my adolescent body should be wrapped in through the midnight blue cinder blocks. Anything but that, she said. This even isn't even like her. Call her father, I insist. I get dress coded. My father absent, per usual, out looking for work with his phone off. They call my mom instead. The pressure of shame towers over me as I wait for her for hours, reading the ba babysitter's club. I look up and stare. A petite white girl with a lovely pristine green skirt on, shorter than mine, but she's called cute. Administrators is admiring its emerald beauty. My head hangs low. I get into the car. Thighs too thick for an 11 year old. My mom complains, but it's not my fault. Blame God for not answering the many prayers I prayed on the same knees covered in baby fat like the rest of my temple. Blame Rick and EBT for my gluttony when food was finally in the cabinet. It was more than enough, even though we never had enough. Besides those occasional seasonal gifts you received, the hand me downs the lovely red skirt. 
And my last piece is um, one of my favorite poems that I've written this year. Um, and it's called An Ode to Cherry Kublik. So it's based off of my experience being in a um, low income community and just the happiness that was parallel to the things that was actually going on. So here's my last piece. An Ode to Cherry Kublik. In a large glass pitcher with painted white daisies and spearmint green vines sitting on the picnic table. For the babies running in their scrubby sneakers playing cops and robbers in summer springs. Left over red solo cups from last night's kids back cup in the playground. Burnt, broken, black, and mouths become fair game. Picked by the kids beside as cops wearing lengthy towels around their necks like capes. Villains amongst wood chips covered with dry blood, burnt brown and burgundy. Small fist-sized hearts beat with thrills as robbers toting bright lemon-colored water guns search for an old big lighter and trash cans crusted with mold and remnants of their siblings loaded diapers. Trash bags tied inside but never taken out, festering and rotting like the floorboards on their balconies. And the cops wait by picking up old cups to sip icy cherry Kool-Aid, sweat dripping from their sunburnt foreheads like the water droplets on the curvy pitcher. And their light brown lips stain cardinal red as they throw their heads back and forth like they're taking shots of sour vodka and mama's honey. Laughing, they collectively guzzle down a whole bag of sugar nine packets of cherry Kool-Aid and a gallon of water. The robbers rush to get a gulp carrying a neon rainbow of lighters with about two strikes left in each one. Fathers are still at the store buying formula milk or heading to their second afternoon job and mamas are in their homes, resting their bones, fractured by arthritis, preparing for their fourth shifts or watching the Real Housewives of Atlanta, dreaming of taking the place of these personas, picking pieces of Prada, Gucci, and Versace with their husband's finances. He and children unable to interrupt their cameos, but they're present in their lives with drinking bubbly drama through wine glasses they could never afford on their own. Their injections mummifying their teen Coca-Cola figures before pregnancy and never having to carry their entire family on their narrow shoulders, kicking their babies out to play and explore the hood to find a life of their own, intoxicated with spiked Kool-Aid, yelling with their raspy voices, stay in or out and stop letting all my damn cool air out that motherfucking door. The cops and robbers work together in their uniforms, caked with drips of Kool-Aid, tiny clay, and wood chips. One robber lightly holds the loose butt between his two fingers the size of the black of his mouth, and a cop grabs a scuffed, fluorescent lima green lighter and flicks and flicks and flicks a stinging callus on his thumb. Another cop tries, one strike gone, the blood trying to scoop up the heat and ignite. The last strike catches and they suck and pass, and suck and pass the bottom of the blackened mouth. Their throats and stained tongues burn and sear like fresh cheese and steak placed in a hot cast iron skillet. Choking and coughing up the ash, they rush to the picture of cherry Kool-Aid, bright red like the roses on the concrete, spilled from the heads of their old playmates, and they quench their thirst. Soothe the tightness in their chest, resurrect their burnt lungs to run again, and to repeat. Thank you. but she will tell you how, deep in her cold heart, she feels more nymph than human. Her work has been recognized by Young Arts and Scholastics Arts and Writing Awards. Her poetry, almost always about Alice Neal or the absence within her, this is dark, <laughs> this is really dark, <laughs> has been published in Paper Crane Journal, Peach Magazine, and multiple anthologies. Oftentimes, Grace can be found barefoot in a field or garden gathering. Uh, or garden gathering grain and ripe fruit for her winter slumber because she is a very sleepy, ravenous girl. <laughs> I wrote that bio so that my, um, <laughs> Alan Rossum could describe me as a ravenous girl for my last reading. <laughs> um, so now that you all perceive me the way I want you to, as a very hungry, very sleepy girl, <laughs> first poem, which is about Alice Neal and about absences, so I could kill two birds with one stone. This is the first poem, Alice Neal to Grace Warren Page, after Marty McConnell, which is like Alice in the Talking Stone. 
You have been searching to fill, fill your empty stomach with something, and let me tell you, stripping naked in the vineyard and squishing Concord grapes between your toes to make wine by dancing around in a wooden bucket, or covering your chest with dirt and thick patchwork jackets, or hanging wet bed sheets from your window during the winter to watch them slowly stiffen won't make you any less hungry. <clears throat> it's funny how much you talk about hunger, my dear. <laughs> There is so there is no such thing as absences, only things you search for until you find it, or you don't. Grace, you are forcing your head up to face this world by holding a fistful of your own hair. Let go. The strands of you are thin. What you are looking for is the child who used to beat against every good part of you. Here, drink this pomegranate tea and eat bites of this bread. Sit in this blue striped chair and let me tell you, a couple years ago, I watched you force the child within to slither out from your throat scraping the taste of her from your stomach with a spoon, like how toddlers scoop the slug from cracked snail shells because they just don't understand one can't live without the other. You told her to drag what's left to search for something better. Grace, we both know the girl you sent away as a soft underbelly, searching for something to nest inside of. I know you won't listen to me, so here, take this blue hydrangea I clipped from the flower box yesterday, go out to the garden and fit it back into the ground like it was never cut. Stay out there, barefoot and small bones, until you find something else you think you can fix. Th this is something only hungry girls do, you know. Wait, your tummy rumbles. A tender organ stomps on the right side of your body. Your empty wants her little girl back. Um, the next one I'm reading is um, a poem for my mother, Christy, and it's called You Kissed My Cheek Before You Left. <clears throat> Confession. I have given my body to this world and everything small dwelling in it, because I belong to nothing else, and I can't help but hate you for dying sometimes. I wake up feeling like a child because of faint rain pattering on my tin roof and moon dulled shadows haunting summer evenings. After those storms, when I feel nothing like myself, I knot and crisscross in muddy puddles and tilt my head under water trickle, dripping from rain gutters to wash my hair with goat soap and sponges. I want to remember something only the earth was witness to, because you and your sequined rage and tear-clogged throat only find me in dreams where I'm shivering in a sling tied between two posts. Before you pull me up by my wrist to kiss my baby hairs, you dab vanilla extract on my temples and behind my earlobes in hopes a creature will find me. Then you point to a robin falling freely from a wire, and you tell me my arms are his to perch. I give him more than my limbs. I cradle earthworms in my mouth, ready for him to peck away at my lips and burrow in my hair. I am tired of this grief, and I'd do anything to have you here again, sealing a loose eyelash from my cheek, making a wish as you offer me to the wind from your fingertips. Um, the next one I'm reading is an excerpt from my essay, Breaking Fruit, about my nanny I had growing up as a child named Rolinda. And um, this is the first section of that. Sugar apple. On damp afternoons, I woke from nightmares. I scuffled to Erlinda's lap and wiped my eyes on the hem of her perfumed floor-length skirt. I was not her favorite child, and I told her often how much I disliked her. But she was the only one there for me when I cried. I had no other choice but to let her quilt swaddle my body, tell me stories of jungles, overcrowded fairies, and women with bright lipstick and jeweled heels. She held both my hands in hers, the way she held fruit before she broke it in half firm and gentle. She compared my nightmarish chills to a slump-mouthed farmer she once knew. He swallowed the poisonous black seeds of a sugar apple and hoped the gods would bless him with a vision while he slept, whispered to him something the land he tended couldn't. The seeds soaked in his stomach through the night, and he dreamt that the soil he churned with his plow engulfed him. Nightmares, she knew, came to wake those asking for too much. My hands wouldn't break the knobby emerald skin of a sugar apple like she could after washing dozens, scrubbing until her fingers pruned. Erlinda said I would be the silly girl to place spoonfuls of the custard fruit on my doorstep for eagles to peck during the night. Such a waste. Erlinda brushed strands of my hair from my sweat-sticky forehead and made sure not to mistake us for light. She was rigid, babysitting me late into the day while her husband, Bobby, the landscape landscaper with the dragon tattoo wrapped around his forearm, worked for every neighborhood in town. I cried when my mother left me with Erlinda early in the morning. She painted her nails lime red and washed soap op Spanish soap operas while I curled next to her feet after the nightmares. From there, I saw the scars on her exposed ankles. 
Decades ago, her dad beat the backs of her legs with split stalks of sugar cane after he came home drunk from the harvest. That's why she left the Philippines and would never go back. Erlinda told me she missed nothing from her home, but I knew she missed this, sitting under the canopy of leaves, hiding from the sun and her father, eating sugar apples until the sweetness stirred within her stomach, within her stomach the subtle, comforting pain of taking in something so good for you, your body doesn't recognize it. She'd tell me, don't be scared of leaving, everyone's left you already. She patted my back and rubbed my knuckles while I cried, whispering, hush, hush, girl, her spiced breath hot on my cheek. She chewed cinnamon gum instead of smoking cigarettes outside in the cold. Her coarse black hair brushed past her waist and her thick rectangular glasses sat on top of her head. She lifted my gaze by gripping my chin, turning my eyes to her. She told me I had a good life and had no reason to cry, comforted me the best way she knew how, blowing her breath on my forehead, pointing to the woman singing on the screen, telling me someone out there is always singing, carrying me back to my bed, humming a woman's tune. She told me nothing would hurt me. There's a certain comfort being cared for by a person who isn't your mother. She knew my nightmares better than anyone. Erlinda told me she Alinda told me she would leave me eventually, get, in, get into Bobby's brisky pickup and never return. After my grandmother died, she left for good. I learned to pat my own back after the nightmares, chew a stick of cinnamon gum, and smack real loud. Such a silly girl, still having nightmares like this. The ones where a man with a machete finds me playing in, a wa in water left from a spewing water spigot. He always killed the people I love in the end, one swoop with a sharp knife, leaving me teary, my clothes sticking to my body so tight it's skin. I call for Erlinda now, for her to hold my clasped hands. I eat the black seeds, plop them in my mouth, and swallow so the gods might send her back to me. She'd tell me I'm always asking for too much. She'd tell me to hush, to pick up my drowsy head and sink once more. But I'm here, with my half of the sugar apple, sitting on the front porch steps, holding a spoonful to whatever may come and peck. When I sleep, I see her sometimes. I run to her lap, and there I rest. I do not mistake this for love. Thank you. Enthusiast. Her favorite characters are Ron and Snape, and she is not at all inclined to explain why. <laughs> she was born in Ohio, and despite only living in the state for three years, feels a certain need to clarify that she is from Ohio, not South Carolina. <laughs> Her work has been recognized, oh, that, that only went over well with a few people here. <laughs> Um, her work has been recognized by Scholastics, Art and Writing, I'm just going to say Scholastics from now on, um, published in Lavender Bones. Um, she has collected over 1,800 hours on Sims 4 and 200 hours on Stardew Valley. <laughs> um, she is also an ecstatic Westwood Red Hawks baseball fan, and she'll be studying at Anderson University in the fall of 2022 as a double major in secondary English education, English literature. Everybody, Emma McCarthy. <laughs> Winter, the snow is mint-colored and fluffy. 
Spring holds flowers and varieties of emerald, pear, and chartreuse. The summer heat bakes the leaves to pine, juniper, and moss. When, autumn's come, when autumn comes, the leaves fall to the ground, leaving sage tree trunks behind. My keeper has fashioned me a home made from a matchbox mattress, cotton ball pillow, and torn tissue blanket. When the sun streams in from the window, my white inner world catches color as I watch the green outer world turn lighter. My keeper feeds me cookie crumbs, drops them down into the mouth of the bottle. I swallow each one whole, let it sit in the bottom of my stomach like a rock. My keeper cries into the bottle each night. I collect her tears in a cap and slurp them up as the next one falls. Her keeper is not as kind as mine. He feeds her once a day with the warning that her next meal is far away. On Sundays, she leaves our room for an hour to learn French, and when she returns, she feeds me ice cream, dripping sweet, cold milk from the edge of the teaspoon. I lick the sticky trail from the glass until my tongue turns raw, leaving a red streak against the sea green. Some midnights, I hear her speak in her sleep. She whispers the name she gave me, Gislin. The last piece I'm going to be reading is the beginning of my story called Life in a Box, which is a sci-fi story about a girl named Riley Anderson who's inspired by my sister and my mom, and her dad who's inspired by my dad. <laughs> Riley Anderson is determined never to leave her room again. It's mid-July and sticky, hot air is streaming through the window, which she has left cracked to piss off her dad. She doesn't <laughs> want to see her dad. They were best friends once but, once, but this June he messed up when he dragged Riley all the way across the country from her mom, who he divorced, and won custody of her. Too bad for him, she thinks. The fight was for nothing. She flops around on her bed, moving her laptop from the side to the end of the bed, the blue screen lighting up her cinnamon brown eyes. Riley is 16 and has shoulder-length straight brown hair that she keeps tied back in a ponytail most of the time to avoid washing it. Not washing her hair is a part of her strategy for staying in her room, and she successfully trained it to only washing twice a week. Riley stretches out on her bed and plays with her belly button ring, black diamond embossed that flashes nicely against her tan skin. Her light body ruffles her bedclothes, and she straightens them underneath her when she's found a good position to browse eBay in. First, she eyes a pair of black and red roller skates and decides she must own them. She places a bet of an exuberant amount using her dad's credit card number, but before she hits the button, she remembers that there's no point in owning roller skates when you don't go outside. <laughs> For a minute, she thinks she should order them anyways just to make a purchase on the card, but then she realizes that's exactly what her dad would want, her to make an immature purchase just to spite him. She has to prove that she's three steps ahead of him, so she closes the tab. She turns on her TV and flicks through the different streaming services. She has basically all of them, so she can really watch anything in the world she wants. And somehow, she still feels there's nothing to watch. She decides to play music instead and lays back on her black set and pillowcase, closes her eyes, and tries to imagine a video in her head to go with the song she's listening to, California by Blink-182. Mm -hmm. At some point, she falls asleep. When she wakes up, it's dark outside, and there's a text from her dad on the phone saying dinner is outside her door. She goes over to her door and opens it carefully so she can't be seen pulling the dish inside. It's cold mac and cheese. On top is a note from her dad reading, mac and cheese for my cheese ball. <laughs> Riley scoffs and throws the note in the black trash can next to her desk. Riley takes a deep breath and then sits down at her desk to eat. She scrolls through her phone, passing through all of her friends' Instagram posts, but not liking them. The only friend that's reached out since she moved asks if she left her guitar at her old house. She clicks on her explore page and scrolls through the ads. After a few minutes of scrolling, she finds an ad for something she hasn't seen before. In a completely white square is a cardboard box with bold black letters imposed over it, reading life in a box. Weird, she thinks, and clicks on the link in the comment. It opens Safari and brings her to a website with the same title as the one on the box. The heading of the page reads, life in a box, never experience boredom again. Riley switches to the products tab. In rows of two are tons of little boxes, each with different lettered titles and posts on them. Prom, first date, state fair, last day of school are some of the ones she reads. She scrolls through the tab for several minutes, reading all different titles from firstborn son to grandma funeral. She can't decide which one she wants to click on the most, so she clicks on the about tab to read a description of the boxes. Life in a 
box provides crucial life experiences right from your bedroom. Feel like you're missing into something in life? Think you'll never have any new friends? Experiencing FOMO? <laughs> life in a box provides solutions to all of these problems and more. Life in a box creates a personally tailored experience to the user, complete with real-life relationship accuracy and the ability to generate new relationships using a geolocator. Life in a box takes into account the person's emotions and thoughts at the time to create a realistic and fulfilling experience. Try life in a box today, reads the description. Underneath, in very small print, are several warnings. Liab is not responsible for injuries, heartbreaks, health conditions, or expenses incurred inside of the box. The purchase of a Liab constitutes an agreement that the consumer will not pursue Liab in court. Her total ends up $212.45. She autofills the payment information with her dad's credit card. She reads the estimated delivery date, July 31st, and closes the tab. Thank you. Cassie Drew um, from uh, West Columbia, South Carolina, and is frequently stuck in her own head, and that's true. <laughs> Cassie's in my class right now, but you pop out. Um, if you happen to be looking for them, your best bet would probably be the library where they're sneaking gummy bears. They tried to start a Procrastinators Anonymous, but forgot the deadline for club submissions. Cassie Drew. <laughs> I wanted it to stop. 
I guess it works because no one has come around since. Don't suppose I blame them. Have you seen me? I guess that's a dumb question. I guess all of you have seen me in some capacity. I am kind of famous around here. Maybe infamous, depending on who you ask. Those that call me monster, have you looked in the mirror lately? My next piece is an erasure poem of the one that I just read. An open letter who called monster. You are a monster you ran from me, who you took pieces from, you expected love, didn't you? Wanted something rotten, but I have hope, Father. Do you look in the mirror? My next piece is called To the Monster Under the Bed. You didn't have to lose your head. I think your ideas are just as good as they were. I can tell that you tried. I am still entertained by you, I promise. You were gone then, weren't you? I noticed that you changed your shape. I wish you could have asked me. I miss those parts of you that are gone. Did you at least choose something that shows your personality? The smell wasn't that bad, but you know that you didn't have to change for me. Do you like being under my bed? Wouldn't you want a spot more comfortable? As far as the spot in my mind, you'll always have it if you want it. Haunting isn't the word I would use. My final piece is called, I do not think I can forgive. But that is not to say I cannot love, that I will not hold the pieces together with duct tape when I cannot allow myself to allow stitches. The memories are lessons I process and try to let go. The arms I have been told squeeze all the good things out of a hug. The hands that hold tight enough to guide back together after too much pressure. The heart that runs hot with all the things that I have not yet allowed myself to feel. The body that holds all of these things prove that broken glass makes the brightest rainbow if given time to change perspective. Thank you. James Rabin is not a natural blonde. <laughs> Instead, he is a natural material girl. <laughs> but it's plural? Broadway <laughs> <laughs> enthusiast and body positive. Clearly, I have no idea what that is. Broadway enthusiast, body positive model. He likes long walks on the beach, fried chicken, and you can find him hiding in the bathtub during fire drills, making memes about literally anything, and completing a virtual degree program to be a professional hitman. I, I didn't know that, I'm so impressed. Uh, he will be attending Columbia College Chicago this fall with a major in creative nonfiction. Yep, there we go, that's everything. That's James Raymond. to be reading a persona poem based off of one of my fiction characters. Her name is Charlene Allen. Uh, she lives in Alabama and she has a wraparound porch, so this is, this is a fun one. Uh, this is titled, Charlene Allen Talks About Motherhood. Another year gone by is just another moment in time where I read myself to sleep in my recliner and leave the TV on at four in the morning. I wake up and make a pot of coffee, but I do not drink any. Instead, I fill a mug with orange juice and sit on the front porch and watch the sky turn from shadow to sorbet to the music of my battling thrift store wind chimes. And the shattered bits of flower pots from throwing ball with their father sit on the railing, still coated with soil and memories that wrap around our house that's been this awful shade of yellow for as long as I can remember. I doubt my kids will even remember this house in a few years because they ain't babies anymore and they don't let me kiss them but I still do their damn laundry and call out for them at dinner time, just so they can take it back to their rooms and eat alone. But I still know they love me by the way they leave their muddy shoes outside every day after practice, and the way they don't forget to wash the dirt from their palms that have seen so many backhanded tears. They never forget to eat or laugh. They only forget that I am here, like the breath that blows away dust, or the sound of a familiar voice 
just to clean up behind me. Okay, the next is a nonfiction essay titled Chicken or Egg. When I returned to my sixth grade homeroom class at the end of the day, my teacher was delicately removing a dead bird from our class's incubator. She scooped its limp body out of its poorly shattered shell with an index card and placed it into an empty Walmart bag. Hovering it gently over the trash bin, she wished us all a good weekend and then sent us to go get our backpacks and clear our lockers. I stayed behind and asked her what happened to the bird as she dropped it into the bin. I'm not sure, she said. The others seem to be okay. My first and final heterosexual relationship began and ended in the sixth grade. She was in another homeroom class, which means we only saw each other once a day, and we sat together in chorus class. We sang beautifully. We made a habit out of holding hands together while the teacher conducted the class's mashup of Thinking Out Loud by Ed Sheeran and I'm Not the Only One by Sam Smith. My entire class knew Sam Smith was gay. A couple of the boys made jokes to one another quietly, but I did not. I told myself that I liked girls, and boy, was I lying? Uh, but back then, there was no way that I would be gay. Anytime a boy glared directly at me, I would look away, or when they would tease me, I would tell them that I was busy with my prepubescent voice that my girlfriend loved. I couldn't bring myself to tell her how I was feeling. I didn't want to be tied down to her anymore. I wanted to focus on my soon-to-be parenthood. You know, I had never seen a chick, but I had seen a girl, I told myself. <laughs> the week prior to the chick's death, my classmates and I all fidgeted and prayed for the birds as they began to peck through their rotund shells one by one. I was among them, blindly entering a world of light and noise. And as I watched the bird with the death wish slowly force its way out of its weak capsule before course class, I kept thinking of ways to break up with her, to start a new life. So I texted her about the dead chicken that afternoon on the bus, and she quickly brushed away the subject by inviting me to her birthday party at the roller rink that Sunday. It didn't take long for me to realize that she believed that our relationship was getting serious, and I feared the next step was marriage. And I knew how marriages ended. They ended with a closeted gay child and not having a bed to call their own. Soon pegging through the surface of a new life with stories to tell. This is one of those. Once I arrived at the roller rink that Sunday, I was the only person there except for my girlfriend and her mother. And I quickly realized that this was not a party anymore. It was a chaperone date. And towards the end of the day, she had me cornered, rolling slowly towards me with puckered lips, and in a sudden escape, I shook off my skates and ran to the bathroom with no shoes on, inevitably soaking my socks in whatever liquid rested on the bottom of the handicap stall, soon to be mixed with my anxious tears. As my mom dismissed me from the party a few minutes later, the sky above the parking lot was swarmed with white gray clouds. Occasionally, bits of sun and backdrop peeked through as my mother patted my back and tried to stop the tears as she drove. I don't know why I was upset. If it was the influx of emotions from the previous week, the fear of facing my queerness, or the uncomfortable wetness of my socks from the bathroom floor. All I, knew to, all I knew how to do was to let my mother comfort me and wait for me to grow up and get over it. At school the next day, the class had a handful of healthy, squeaking little birds, soon sprouting yellow feathers and learning how to maintain their balance. That afternoon, my girlfriend broke up with me by spitting her pink bubble gum out into my hand. The gum began to sink into the creases of my palm, and a puddle of fluid surrounded it. I don't know why I was sad. I don't know why I cried. I flicked the fleshy mass into the garbage and felt the way any kid would feel, how any chicken would feel, defeated. And the final piece is a poem entitled Raw. You are a stranger to mirrors. You can barely make eye contact with yourself when you wash hands, get dressed, rub string through your gums. This time you are drying off your body. You are clean. Now, finally, you are new. You must make acquaintance with yourself. Say hello. Direct your eyes along your outline, one of winding roads and scar-like marks all over your body. This is what you are, and this is what you look like. Understand that nothing will change instantly. Understand that matter cannot be destroyed like this voice inside of you. Outside of you rests a human, shell covered in water, in salt, in sand. Long gone are you, washed away from the tide, and long gone is your smile. Now placid, calmly it rests like the underbelly of a turtle, winding through dunes, through men, through life. 
You wish that you could shed love-struck emotions alongside your body. That's okay. Hate yourself. You must eventually understand that this feeling never ends. Thank you. recognized by Scholastic's Art and Writing Awards and the Literary Journal Lavender Bones. Reed one day dreams of becoming a cryptid folktale in a small town. <laughs> and if you're looking for Reed, try looking at the farthest rock from the heart of campus, one of the same two tables in the library, at the coffee station for the redacted time today. I'm going to go seven, seventh time today. Or <laughs> just follow the frustrated screams in relation to quantum whatnot and other incomprehensible theoretical sciences, Reed Shepard. I didn't fall, please be proud. Um, <laughs> I'm Reed, I'm gonna read because that's what I was destined to do apparently. Um, <clears throat> Oh wait, sorry. That one has crumbs on it, my bad. Anyway, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate reality in which Lady Eboshi does not fire the gun. One. And my mother never made Halloween-themed gift baskets for our oncology nurses the first time she had surgery. And my mother never shaved her head in the kitchen while I watched Nightmare Before Christmas on Blu-ray. And my mother never asked her brother to fly down from Pennsylvania to help take care of me and my brother. And my mother never bought a Frigidaire deep freezer to store forgotten Stouffer's family-sized vegetable lasagna. Two. And Ashitaka never, had, never yelled for Yakul to run from the watchtower as it was falling. And Ashitaka never had to sit across from Hisama to be told that he would have to leave in the dead of night. And Ashitaka never got cursed by the embodiment of mankind's hatred for what they don't understand. Nashitaka never lost the war he was fighting, and Ashitaka never had to fight a war. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hilarious, thank you. Um, a portrait of a young lady in love with herself. Given the chance, what girl could refuse the opportunity to be beautiful? Science has developed the face and body of dreams. Improbable. In an age of plastic surgery and bodybuilding and cosmetics, let us hesitate to say impossible. In the future, which exists in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Truth. Did I request to thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Down the paradise lost. Uh, <laughs> Old stall stains my knuckles and fingertips and make a makes a home under my fingernails, paints the inseams of my hand-me-down khaki Carhartt pants a dry blood orange. Finger pads breathe life into burnt umber, river-bottom clay. Thundercloud hands give rain to the impossible sun. The truth settles on the impossible sun's palate, waiting for instruction, avoiding tragedies in places pitch pine do not grow. The impossible son swore on his handmade existence to survive just far enough away from being made in the image of his maker for the impossible son to have the breath of bones. My next one is an erasure of the one I just read. Death. Did I request to be maker from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me John Milton's Paradise Lost? You get it. Uh, <laughs> knuckles and fingertips, a home of hand-me-down blood, life into river cloud rain. The sun dies in his hands away from his maker. Yep, that's gossip. <laughs> He is writing nonfiction about his girlfriend, weightlifting, or hanging out with his, with his best friend Adam Mosley, who's sitting right behind him. 
He believes that there will always be a market for raisins and fabric soft. <laughs> and he has insisted on that all year, and I still have no idea how they go together. He plans to make a million dollars this summer castrating goats. Robert Owen.
But you fall anyway because you wouldn't be the man you are now. And love is her texting you and saying, vermilion has to be the bitchiest color. <laughs> and you feel the weight of your thoughts flowing away. Her eyes take you to a field of lavender and fog. Love is flowing, a river of heavy breathing and tears, of song-like conversations and her voice in your ear, a soft song, a melody more beautiful than the robins. Love is holding your breath every time she says, we need to talk. And she asks you if you've seen the moon tonight. And on the moon is where you found love. Thank you.
cops and robbers role play, <laughs> yoga, group reading, and class discussions. I will say this class is more physical than a lot of people realize going into it, so I'll warn you now. There will be boxing matches, bruises, and nature walks, and plenty of crying. <laughs> on the off chance that we do have an exam or worksheet, I promise it won't be particularly rigorous. Sometimes I just assign stuff to make sure you guys actually listen to me, and I don't just sound like a parent from a Peanuts movie. Um, grading scale. 90% higher. Perfection as much? 80 through 89%. Pick it up, feel the bump in our bell curve. 70 through 79%. Underachieving isn't satisfying, but it, it's enough. 60 to 69 percent. Yikes. <laughs> 59 and lower. I'll be seeing you again. Required text. Unfuck your brain by Faith G. Harper. That's a real book, by the way. Anger Management for Dummies by W. Doyle Gently. Surrounded by Idiots by Thomas Erickson. I don't need anger management. I need people to stop pissing me off by Wally Books. Cry Like a Man by Jason Wilson. <laughs> um, materials required. Fluffy pillows. These will serve many functions in this class. From being good to shout into, soaking up tears from mental breakthroughs, and cushioning during extended nap time. Don't forget your favorite pair of Give Up On Life pants. They don't need to be anything special, just something you'll feel comfortable wearing. Since this class is either physical or it's not. Sweats, joggers, and pajama bottoms of some, of some kind work just fine. CBD oils, supplements, and vaporizers. If you don't have any of these products, that's fine. If you do, make sure to bring them for personal use. They aid in the relaxation process. Um, boxing gloves and hand wraps were in and out of class sparring days. I believe physical activity can improve your mental health. However, it won't improve your mental health if you fall into one of my uppercuts. Participate in class activities at your own risk. Um, bring spare wooden bats, golf clubs, and tire irons. No, we're not going to storm the capital. This stuff is for when we get around to that time of the year where we've been approved for field trips. And that's where we tend to be one of the highlights of each year. Hmm. Stress toys, trinkets, and trifles. I understand that a lot of anger tends to be rooted in anxiety, depression, and past trauma. I don't want to deprive you of your portable outlets, whether that be fidget cube, stress balls, or the picture of someone special you keep on hand. Earmuffs slash earbuds. These are for when some, uh, for when something you, oh, for when you need to isolate yourself from class for a moment. You won't be able to keep them in forever, but they're there for when you need them. Lastly, you'll want to have either a physical journal or one you can keep online. This is important. This journal will have some heavy emotional real estate and keep track of your personal growth. Don't lose this journal. Don't abuse this journal. It's here to be your friend, so please don't tear pages out of it in frustration. Instructor's Bible. Adam Mosley is a student, writer, and human being who is familiar with anger and how detrimental it can be to one's health. Before making strides to become more approachable, he was long-faced and bitch-monitored. No matter how many people were in a given room with him, he often felt isolated. Nowadays, though, you'd be lucky if you could bump into him and not have to deal with cornball jokes cracked from his gap through smile. So how about you? Are you keeping a level head? If not, you should swing by his class on Tuesday or Thursday. If, um, if that doesn't fit your schedule, maybe give rewiring your brain a try once you have some free time. Okay, take the class, but don't take that last part too seriously, okay? I'm not mad at you. Don't be mad at me. <laughs> South Carolina, and he was only one. He has not been published yet, but his work has received honorable mentions and a silver key from the annual Scholastics Art and Writing Awards. Everyone, Aiden Simmons. Just wanting approval from his dad, but his dad's just not giving it. 
and so on. Yes, I'll continue. Does Chow, I Chow's father, only allow the stars of sitcoms for the kind of gentleman who wears pink designer jeans and had a very sad wife at the table in the second pit? I love the white lacquer walls that his team called a personality. He loved the popular menu items of proms, brown, white, and green. And when you ask the waiter what gave them their color, that was likely to mutter spinach and remember urgent business in the kitchen. He loved that. A noodle chef usually made an appearance around 8 o'clock, forcing our high off while karate chopping the air. Then he loved the slab of dough and slam it on toilet's ribbon thick strings, strands. The noodles were served with elastic and oily meat sauce. They came on little white dishes. And you ate them using heavy, and you ate them using heavy silver forks with cursive monograms printed on their shafts. He loved all of this. There were other outstanding dishes, the duck on a bed of peanuts, the squab accompanied by a gummy sweat sweet plum sauce, and a sheaf of iceberg lettuce leaves for the making of your own rolls. But he hated how little of a role he played at the second pit. The main attraction were fragments of art of which when you sniffed, you took in the stale air of another century. The black and white pictures had never been exhibited before, but provided a roadmap for teenagers in parking lots and on street corners, and the additional images of bare bedrooms, lonely country highways, nearly empty diners speak most eloquently of making insignificant places important. They are, they are evocations of an unsettled America. One depicts the curled toes of a stone-looking kid sitting on a car hood, which makes one look anew at, at the highways and motels that seem to have gone the way of tube socks and feather hair. I enjoyed these, but he had his own that he enjoyed a little more. His own wall of art, located in the back corner of the dining area, where often no one sat or even acknowledged, was the only place Dutch would let him hang them up. I had all of his comedic role models displayed, guys like Bernie Mac, Eddie Griffin, Andrew Dice Clay, Russell Peters, and more. All to the disapproval of his father, Dutch, who wanted his son to be proper role models, such as Yayoi Kusama, Katrusika, Bakokutai, Peter Doi, real artists, as Dutch often said. I put tonight a seat in the dining area of Ice Father because every seat was for the ass of a customer, not a kid. He still managed to be once he still managed to be amongst the customers in his own way though. Dressing up as a waiter in roller skates, floating from table to table. Not to take orders or read full glasses, rather to tell jokes and engage in jocular banter that sometimes resulted in brief scuffles between Ike and customers who didn't appreciate his staff to their appearance, no matter how big a laugh got out of the table. Father Child would always make sure to intervene at moments like these reassuring the victim that his son had no ill intent, that it was all in good fun, and he was only an aspiring comedian working on his crowd work. I could feel belittled and insignificant in these moments, wondering how to do anything right. One recent bitter cold night, T-shirts and leopard sprint entered the pit, and their leader, Madonna Sutton, voiced for the entire restaurant that he'd be purchasing nearly 150 works on January 21st at 7 or 9 a.m., and exactly one week. Chow came out and stated that this was nonsense, and people may like the words he just paid up on his restaurant walls, but that isn't given the right to buy them, especially those in leopard print shirts. I peeked his head out from the kitchen and strode with pride to his father's side, placed an arm around his shoulder, and gestured to the far corner where his, art, where his own artwork sat. Take a mind and leave my father's, he said courageously. His father rolled his eyes as Madonna shook her head no, and stepped to the centermost table in the dining area, mounted herself atop of it, and began to sing Hey Sarah, Sarah by Doris Day. And Mr. Chow was so taken aback that he served Madonna's crew the duck and the squab, along with the white and green prawns, completely on the house. I proceeded to his corner and carefully removed dice play off the wall and sat him in the seat in front of him and ate. He'd done this so often before and enjoyed talking with him. Dice asked him, hey babe, what's in the bowl? Just some noodles, I said. I'd ask for a bite, but you don't have but you have to pick me out of this first, and I'm not sure and I'm sure you don't want that mess. Your pops would have a fit, Dice continued. You're always hungry, I said. You're always eating good shit. And whenever you're eating hits my nose, I want to put it in my mouth. Now you tell me you're a city of person. The one who eats a good food in front of someone who can't eat, or someone just waiting, or someone just wanting to taste it. Dice reason. I never thought it made you shitty. Just make an observation, I said, slightly annoyed. I already feel shitty as it is. I can never be right by my dad. Yeah, that Dutch child was a hard one, Dice said. Then they sat for the next little while while the ambient sounds of Madonna singing and Dutch child's laughter hanging in the background. Madonna and her leopard posse were done eating. 
Mr. Chow asked that the sale was still taking place in a week. Madonna then said a time and tell by Bar Marley and the Whalers on her exit from the restaurant. Ike's father sold all the art. He needed the money after all. But with the loss of his father's art, Ike witnessed the loss of his father's business. And if he and his father could agree on one thing, it was that the sunken pit needed a new attraction. When Dutch Bach bought his son's gallery of comedians, Ike suddenly knew. He walked up to him. I can help you, Dad. I want to help you. Trust me, I can handle it, he said. Soft yet commanding. His father burst into a brief bit of laughter. You really are a leery son. Now, if you don't mind, I've got some calls to make. Dutch spent the next few days finding people close to him who represented the comedians to try and get a commitment from one of them. But the asking price was just too high. In his heyday, the second pit could have brought in anyone Dutch wanted. But now, without the art, the pit, like an aging sitcom star in the 70s, had lost its appeal. Being the kind of gentleman who wears pink designer jeans and has a very tender wife, that didn't get you a table now, unless your very tender wife was Madonna's son. And suddenly the name Madonna floated into his mind, the woman who caused all this. She'd have to be it, the new attraction. She was perfect. So when Dutch brought together the entire staff and Ike to inform them of the news, everyone was on board. And then there was Ike. I can be funny, if only you would let me. I'm not just going to sit around and watch you choke. I want to actually be there for you, Paul. He burst out. He then went off to his corner, took down his works, and started off through the front entrance. Thank you. Scientists say that they huddle together because they are social butterflies, 
because they simply cannot handle the loneliness that comes with cold. Like the, iso like the isolation you feel when your fingers freeze up because you think gloves are not a decent fashion statement and there is no one to warm them up or even care to ask if you are cold. When you're old, you'll think about how death, you'll think about death when you wake up, how death must be oddly cold, the way your lungs swell for the last time, memories, memories clogging them, how the memories were drained from your lungs in the form of oxygen. And you'll think about penguins, how you have forgotten about them up until this very moment, and you'll long for them to offer up a pebble and rest their head into your lap as you take your final breath. And my next poem is um, kind of like an ode to one of my passions, which is superheroes. And <laughs> this is my favorite superhero. His name is Nightwing, and anybody. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's called Nightwing Breaks Up with Another Superhero. <laughs> I would like to keep a nice glass table in my living room every once in a while. I am known in rooms to go as the guy who can't keep furniture. Fire singed cushions and spell consumed pillows that would fight back. Bat girl once locked me out of the bat cave because she caught me cheating. Said that I was dumb for getting caught with a magician. That she knows everything because she's an oracle. And that in the end, I will always be alone. Batman wasn't even able to intervene there. Instead, he appeared on the ledge of my balcony where Satana had cried, where I told her we were over, a spell that lasted too long, and told me that I was an idiot and that he will always be lurking in the shadows protecting me. And I sit in the same cafe I come to after every breakup, the one where the penguin was last caught, expressing that my skills unimpressed him now, and that he will leave me sooner or later. And the windows are made of bulletproof glass because in Gotham, everything seems to be broken in one way or another. Bones, superheroes, hearts. And I stir my cold coffee that Corey would have heated for me by now and stare outside the window and think how lonely it must be to be single in Gotham. Thank you. Scholastics, and her fiction has been published in Havoc magazine. Uh, Katie doesn't have any of her own pets, but her friend has a Madagascar hissing cockroach named Renesme. Renesme! <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> and from time to time, she's allowed to feed her apple cores. And also, Katie, I think, I'm trying to convince her of this, um, has a particular affinity for sci fi that she needs to follow. And Katie Davis, everybody. <laughs> Outliving them 100, 1,000, 
one million times over and still never stopping. This, he tells the class, is the length of hell. <laughs> the length of hell and the love of God. <laughs> On the car ride home, her arms feel heavy and numb, and her breath is shallow. It burns in her throat. What's eternity, she wonders. A bottomless well with numbered bricks. What's hell? She sees her body melting in bedrock. Her body ground apart, then ground apart again. She has a strong imagination. Her ears are hot. Her ears are ringing. And as she looks out the car, at the black lines of fences and houses and trees, her whole chest turns cold and twists. Because the day is ending, the week is ending, and, the, and apparently there are certain things in this universe that push on and on and on. When she hears her heart beating at the bottom of her throat, she wonders if this is acknowledgement. Maybe it's a sign, she thinks. Maybe it's her Jesus. Maybe he's banging on his walls, stomping on his porch, shouting words of comfort into the shadows of her ribs. Thank you, she tells him, and her breathing gets steadier. Already, her heartbeat starts to fade. Do I have to exist forever, she asks him. And when the car turns into her neighborhood and she wraps her arms around her knees, all she hears is a quiet shaking somewhere deep inside her chest. Um, my next piece is a piece of poetry that I wrote on a plane because I was sleep deprived and also like, now that I think about it, feeling like a lot of emotions. Um, so this is letters sent from O'Hare to Charlotte. Dear all, I'm distracted on a plane now. It's banking from the forest and the tower in the trees. There's been a lot of shuffling and the swiveling of elbows, staleness you can click your teeth in. Muddy shoes drawn beneath yellow eyes, sculpted, snotty, human prettiness. Am I twisting just like them? They're using dreamy words like make way for luggage. We're moving now. Somewhere, someone is getting angry. We take off and it's like it's screaming because we're ripping it off the ground or because it doesn't want to go like we want to go the day after tomorrow has snacked on top the wheels. I watch the world drain down. My eyes float and the fat beneath my skin flattens like butter beneath a rock. Sometimes it's important to point out the obvious. When this ends, we'll be somewhere else. I think the usual thoughts Ants on a line and tinsel towns, the most beautiful thrill rug I've ever seen. Lakes like holes, land that needs your attention. I find it hard to know the distance of things. Thank you. especially the Tolkien variety, as well as lengthy games of Dungeons and Dragons. He dislikes tomatoes and the cardinal direction west. <laughs> His work has been published in Celestite Poetry and has received silver and gold keys in the Scholastics and uh, Arts and Writing Awards. Um, and he can be found buried under his 12 blankets, uncovering elder tours, or simply waiting near Scott's office to scare him. <laughs>
And for context, the first and last poem that I'm going to read had the same title. Um, yeah, here we go. Let us start with the mass. Let us start at the center, which is perhaps the most important place to start. Let us start at the mass, the horrible truth, the weight and worth of cargo carried, the bells tolling, crews singing their faithful Hail Marys, captain confessing of his trespasses. Let us start with the ramrod, the steel dust serpent, the cannon's thunder supply across the bay, bay, blood and salt converging, storm of steel and holy salt unites. Let us start with a fevered prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, a sword unto our souls. Let us start with another prayer, a prayer to be swift, a prayer for blades to find purchase, a prayer for flesh and gold and blood and water. Let us start with the dead. They are more lucky than the living, tied to the mass, robbed, bound to watch their treasure stolen, their lives taking, taken with the sinking, the horrible, terrible sinking. Let us start with the mass, split and writhing, timber snapping and shuddering in the water, closing away from the light. Let us end with the truth. Let us end with the crepuscular dawn and the dead rising to the surface, waiting to be found, once again ravaged and eaten. Chimera. No, let us start at the mouth. The mouth is where all beginnings come into life. Look into the hungry maw, Pool with foxglove and milkweed and jeweled hyacinths, behind splayed teeth, curving and spinning into half moons and shattered stars. Kite the wings together, draping leather and metal over a mane of saffron. One of these hands is human, gasping for soiled blood, the other is clawed, primal, sprouting with patches of fleecy fur. Dying embers feed the black night, drifting from the mouth, star fragments segmented, the scales lay lusterless writhing into decayed flesh. Fungus spindles upwards, praising the night. Name this moment a creature, a guttural mutation. Deadhead is deadhead for flowers, a bountiful bouquet. Leave its name unto your lies, your myths of a monster. When you replant this life into an elder garden and tend to it with lies and sufferings, do not be surprised when it grows into what you made it, a creature bustling with poison, ready to destroy all that once made it beautiful. Uh, for context, this next poem is from the point of view of a unicorn, which in mythology is often known to judge people uh, for like if they're pure of heart or not. Horn of Blessing. You have come seeking my blessing, intruder of my grove. Long have I dwelled as a judge of man. Step forward, face the point of my ivory horn, the sword of my brow, shining with the burden of purity. Stranger, I do not judge the pure of heart, for from that war there is no victor. Stranger, I do not judge thine own good deeds. I judge the filth and shadow fetters of the heart. I judge the sin that never truly washes away. Stranger, seeker of the unicorn's blessing, hear my verdict. I bless those whose sin does not define them. I bless those who seek to move towards the narrow, better path. But if I look into your heart and see only decay, something distant and cold, then stranger, I shall burn and flay your soul with my own horn. Stranger, ask yourself, do you stand before me seeking blessing for the sake of my blessing, or would you don it like a trophy, wear it as a token of battle, so that all shall see that you, above all else, are truly pure? And the final poem is entitled, Like the First Mask. I think I'm tired of drifting, marrying myself to the sea, undoing my broken strands day by day. I haven't learned how to stitch myself together again, to center myself in the middle of the storm, the whirlwind, the maddening calm of the waves. I'm too tired for dreams tonight. Maybe the waves will stay with me. Maybe the salt beneath my fingers will bleed me awake. I've been underwater too long now. The surface at last comes to light. I have counted these sea star constellations one too many times. No ship has come to reel me in. No line will hoist me free. I'll find my own way home. One day, I want to make myself in this ocean. One day, I'll learn to swim again. One day, I'll figure out how to start anew. Thank you.
Alex Serratus is the first Rock Hill Youth Poet Laureate. Um, and their work has been published in Fish Barrel Review and Visions, and has been recognized by Scholastics and Ringling College Stories, Storytellers of Tomorrow contests. Um, they make loving Taylor Swift a personality trait, and are not ashamed of it, and it's totally true. They were glad they ran about the Scream franchise or Howl Pendergrown at any given moment, and they quote Chandler Bing on a daily basis. After graduation, they hope to drink many cups of coffee and someday meet Taylor Swift. I hope you do. Alex Ross.
too young to break, but the skin is cracking, my eyes are fading, my fingers are broken, and I am tracing a painting that was never made. I am becoming everything and nothing all at once. Tell me how long until we're too young for this. And core mandarins. Medium size, average diameter of five centimeters, a hybrid between two mandarins, crossed between a king tambor and little leaf mandarin. Introduced in 1965, flavored best from May to July, cultivated in greenhouses in Japan, vitamin C is relatively low. We are the offspring of our parents, the youngest, left to walk on sunflower seeds and make a home in six pink notes. Maybe if I had a choice, I would have never left my mother's womb. Mercots, honey tangerine, a sweet orange hybrid, its seed parent is the king tangelo. The pollen parent remains to be identified. Originated in Florida. Matures in January to March. Regularly the victim of citrus scab and Alternaria fungus disease. Mercot trees go upright, but branches often bend or break. Honeybee, I hope you can hear me. Loving you has made me a twig. Satsumas, citrus sunshade. Semi-seedless and easy to peel. The dried peel is used in Chinese cuisine. Coloring is dependent upon the climate. Named after Unshu, a famous production area in China during the late Edo period of Japan. In my dreams, I've been here before, trying to learn tricks that I hope will mesmerize. My room is filled with rotting cherry blossom trees. I'm carving your initials into the carpet. So the next poem is titled Notes to AK Freeland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to cry, not while I read this. <laughs> OK. Notes to AK Freeland. I don't know why the cage bird sings or the song of myself. I can't hear the raven's call, and I find the taste of Coke unpleasant. AK, I'm staring at the school of Athens and wondering what it'd be like to live inside a painting. Ancient Greece is only as far as I make it out to be, and I have always had an imaginative mind. AK, if you ever feel, as I do, like grief is eroding at your insides, remind yourself that you are a part of the cosmos. You may tiptoe amidst lunar craters and clutch a star in the palm of your hand and become one with the comets. On Earth, praise the smells of rose and sandalwood, Eat cherries straight out of the jar and curtains of blueberries. Fixate on the tumultuous actions of Nicolas Cage, but only because it brings you joy. I ran across the world in a few hours and continued to call myself average. Severed my face in half to match someone else's love. Swam in the ocean and let a rip current find and bring me home. Often it feels like all the flowers are dying and I'm tiptoeing around broken clocks. AK, I'm drinking sips of something that starts with B and his favorite band played at the senior showcase. Often every night feels like the last time. But AK, after talking to you, I remember everything I once loved. Perpetually spinning in stars and writing sad love ballads. AK, I'm taking my time to say you make me stronger. AK, I'm taking my time to say I love you. Thank you. Andrew Sinclair has been recognized by Scholastics. He doesn't know where he's going to college. Is that still true? No, I figured it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing's a lie now. <laughs> he might just live at the school for a few more years, deep in the walls. <laughs> His favorite activity is barking at people in the courtyard, and he is and always will be hiding in the school's mulch like a stingray lying in wait, <laughs> waiting to strike. He is an interesting guy. Um, the infamous and sinister, 
And I'm from Summerville. Um, I'd be really nervous because there's so many people in the audience, but I'm very awesome and cool, so I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start with my uh, favorite nonfiction piece, but since I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of creating random arbitrary decisions, I am going to start with my poetry. So, let me flip to that, which is halfway through this packet of work. Um, and so it's a bit weird and surrealist, but it has a little narrative action going on, so uh, I hope you all like it. It's about what happens after the poem speaker discovers the art of alchemy. Apotheosis. While studying how caterpillars spit silk in butterfly, I discovered how to X, Y, and to Z with alchemy. Then the sky opened. It was like stretching a shirt until its stitching snaps. Anything blue or pale fled so pitch could commandeer the day sky, and an angel skated down a sunbeam spilling onto a rural world's topsoil, free from any ozone or atmosphere dispersing light's radiance. The angel said, I speak for the monoprogenitor, uh, for the rain of all that glows, and for anything prefixed with gold. His mouth did not move while talking. The angel said, I offer you, he who diamonds coal and coals the abundant brass, a seat at God's ever-extending dinner table. I shook my head no until I was dizzy, but his searing hand wrapped itself around my wrist, and I knew suffering from a rocket's point of view. Upward motion, faster than an airplane, flapping my face until it was red rock and sore for years. Worse, all of God's chairs were marble, harder than any high school bleachers, and as I let his steak sit on my tongue until its fat melted in my mouth, he sloshed champagne in a citrine-crusted goblet. He swilled it in his mouth, and he felt echoed throughout the chamber, so colossal I could not see the walls from any side. But he never got drunk. I'm so perfect, he said, I bet you wish you were me. Then he asked about gemming pebbles without using the word alchemy. I kept quiet, happy to know what he did not, so he pondered whether or not I thought I was better than him, and said, I know every groove in your raisin brain, darling. I made you. I see the way you shuffle in your seat. I see the way you roll your eyes until your contacts crash into the lens behind your cornea. I know you. You wish you never knew the art of changing trash into treasure. He turned his lips into his mouth, popped them back out, and yelled, unworthy. <laughs> and so next is my creative nonfiction piece. Um, it's a series of little essays tied together, and in each little essay it bounces between a personal anecdote from my childhood and, and um, an explanation of a concept in physics. In the piece, I'm trying to um, tie the concept of my, or like, I'm tying like that concept in physics to my life. So if you hear a long pause, uh, be ready for a switch from the personal bit to the scientific bit. It's called Explorations in Space Time. <laughs> Section one, perpetual motion. You wave a bent twig up and down and in a circle, imagining a fireball before hurling the faux flames toward your friend. She takes cover behind your yard as great oak and the make-believe embers whisk past her ear. Though you try not to show it, you get frustrated in the way she never gets hit, the way she always eludes the winds of your conjured tornadoes, and the way she jumps as you shockwave the earth. This is your yard, your domain after all, while hers is just a few houses down the road. The only distance between you and her is a few effectual motions. Bhaskara II was an Indian mathematician and astronomer from a time before thermodynamic uh, knowledge curtails dreams of perpetual motion with its so-called conservation of energy and entropy. From a time when master physicists could still daydream rose-filtered reveries about perpetual motion. Beyond pioneering differential calculus and merely calculating the time in an astronomical year, he drafted an idea for Vascara's wheel, the first machine of its kind, a machine that, get this, exemplified the state of perpetual motion. Spokes to the center wheel are filled with mercury, and as it spins, the mercury dips and bobs like a balloon and perpetually shifts the weight in the wheel to one side. That weight pushes the wheel down, ensuring it turns forever, or at least it's supposed to. Vascara failed to account for the weight shifted center of mass, so the machine doesn't work. It crawls to a halt, as all things eventually do. It defies some natural law, our reality is conventional motion. The laws of thermodynamics were discovered centuries later, establishing perpetual motion as an impossibility. Because energy decays from the system, a perpetual motion machine would need to create more energy than is input into it, breaking the first law of thermodynamics. But having come this far, a 
perceptual motion of failure after failure, why would the dreamers stop dreaming? They simply stretched their dream into a more spectacular dream, the dream of defying this world's laws, this impossible dream of perpetual motion. You two first talk when you sit across the aisle from each other on the school bus, before it clicks that everyone on the bus lives in the same neighborhood. When you've seen each other from your respective driveways, she yells out your name as like it's the first time you've seen each other in 20 years. Soon you're running over to each other's houses every day after school. You show her your video games, she shows you her dolls, and you hop on your scooters, drifting up and down the winding road, sprinting in circles around trees playing tag, and pretending to be people you aren't, doctors and sorcerers and chefs. This is your burgeoning routine, your newfound perpetual motion. More than a century ago, a perpetual motion wheel not too dissimilar from Bascara's design was assembled over a roadway cutting through Los Angeles. It was fixed in a cafe's billboard, spinning day, as, day and night as Model T's rolled just a few feet underneath. Instead of mercury, spheres swayed back and forth, shimmering in the sun, up and down the machine like hot air. It was a marvel, a masterpiece of perpetual motion. A masterpiece, that is, until a blackout struck, leaving the machine motionless. While this solved the mystery of how the machine materialized the dreams of fringe pseudophysicists and those who dream of perpetual motion, it proved to the citizens of Los Angeles that nothing can move indefinitely, that nothing can remain in the same state forever. Still, though, wouldn't it be grand, something unchanging, forever in motion? When second grade goes faster than I came, your motions stay the same, and as you make your way through fourth and fifth grades, your list of friends shifts like dirt on a baseball field amidst all the tumult of elementary school. The theft of Pokemon cards, all the mishap of turncoat kickball slapping the side of someone or other's head. But you're always there for each other. When you have a month's notice of your mind when you move down south in fifth grade, you keep on playing in your yard and bouncing on your mutual friend's trampoline, dismissing the imminent farewell until just days before it comes. The effort to pretend nothing is changing, after all, takes less effort than to acknowledge time's eventual motion. Thank you. by Scholastics, and she has been published in both Fish Barrel Review and Paper Crane Journal. If given the chance, she will talk your ear off about most genres of rock. In her free time, she can be fine crying over rare vinyl, staring at the ce ceiling with existential dread, or maintaining Lavender Bones magazine, which maybe gives you some of that existential dread, I think, of which she is the managing editor. Uh, she regrets to inform you that she is becoming obsessed with League of Legends, everyone, oh, and more. <laughs> I'm struggling to find the part of myself that died this November, but I know it's there. The body is a selfish machine, and mine has slowed, staining the space beneath my eyes with the darker parts of sunset, lilac fading into night. And maybe this is a lesson on giving more than I take, on presenting every part of myself as an offering to someone because I have exhausted all other currencies. I would do this for you with your honeyed voice like crushed pomegranate seeds in my vision, lips brushing against the juncture of my neck and shoulder while you exhale, leaning all of your weight against me. I would lay myself out on the bathroom floor or string myself up on the wall with Christmas lights, dried orange slices, and Polaroids. I'd carve a trail from my chest downward. I'd sift through the contents of my body, scavenging as they spilled to the floor, and gift you the best part. A forehead to press yours to, hands to warm your cold ones, lungs to breathe what life I can into you instead. And maybe in the midst of my searching, I find what has died, a frozen heart, no longer beating, but beginning to thaw, and my blood and bones rotting. This next one is rooted in Rocky Horror Picture Show, if any of you have seen that. Um, it is 
a letter from the perspective of my heart to Dr. Frankenberger, who is this guy who is like a mad scientist and he builds a boy to fall in love with because he apparently can't get anyone on his own. <laughs> this is called a letter from my robotic heart to Dr. Frankenberger. I too am a being of sex and science, an alien by design, but I want to be bigger, better than the simple scale-brained muscle that relies on blood warmth and longing rather than sustaining itself. I too have left a world of uniformity behind in pursuit of one greater, a place where I'm God enough to grant myself an existence beyond those that have been offered to me, boy or girl, whole or broken, apathetic or open, for I have no interest in the intricacies of man. I am not bound by the binary. The expectation of allowing myself to be defined is something all encompassingly simple. You understand, Doctor, because we are both other. Latticework intelligence, peach bruise against an electric blue sky, ungendered atria and ventricle housing only ourselves too similar to you and I, and all the ways except those we aren't. Because you long to be, you long to be loved. You crave the comfort of a chest to lean your head against and sigh, to be the most prized possession of a boy whose intellect could never match your own. You defy your genius, doctor. Human enough to be as flawed a machine as your species, where I lack that aptitude, stupid enough to die with an excess of emotion. You see, I have forgotten how to feel, full, what it is to be wanted, invited safe into the simple smile of another and asked to stay. There is only the hollow beat of my existence, like a door unanswered, unopened as I watch you. And maybe you too are a fool, chasing your boy as he flees from your affection, for even after all your research, you haven't yet discovered that love is the only experiment doomed to end. Mm -hmm. And this is a creative nonfiction piece that I wrote. It's relatively short. My best friend and I cry a lot, and this is about that, and it is unabashedly savvy, and I love you. <laughs> it's called Grace Note. To my best friend, I never learned to ride a bike or dance without making a fool of myself. Math is an art that I have not mastered. I'm not sure how to ask for help when I need it, on the days where my brain is closer to a string of broken Christmas lights than the organ, and I can't let myself relax into a hug, sighing as tension eases from muscles taut with the steel cables of a bridge. I don't know what it is to be vulnerable. But you, crying as you bury your head into my torso, arms wrapped tightly against my waist, you do. Lying on the floor of an empty classroom, the only sounds are your gasping breaths, muffled by the fabric of my shirt, and my nails against your scalp, parting through your hair. With tired, makeup bruised eyes, you turn to look at me, whispering into this void of almost science spa silent space that you aren't sure who you are. I don't know how to respond. However, I do know this. The first time you introduced yourself to me, I had already known you for months. We walked to the dining hall from our dorms, shivering amid the marrow-piercing chill of a wet December evening. The buzz of other voices drowned around us. In the aftermath of a joke, you glanced at me from the corner of your eye, running a hand through your hair. With a nervous exhale, you told me you decided on your name. Five letters, heavy on your tongue, a weight still unsettled on your body. Great. I know that we continued walking without missing a beat, though when I called you by your new name, I nearly tripped over my own feet side of your smile, bright as the sun's glare on dewdrop glass. I know that a name is meant to be special, the culmination of an identity. When people speak what is supposed to be mine, though, they are addressing someone I will never achieve, a stranger with my face. I look in the mirror and cringe, unable to associate myself with the dead-eyed girl that stares back at me. But you don't use my birth name. We once braved the harsh wind to go to a coffee shop downtown, and we ran into a girl I hadn't seen in years. I wanted to run back into the cold as she began to talk to me, attempting to escape the version of myself she knew as a child, the one who wore glitter-dusted pink glasses and clipped bows into her hair. I didn't. Instead, I wordlessly stood there with you in the moments after the interaction, eyes downcast and chest tight. It's okay, you said. You're okay. I know that the human body is created from elements forged in the hearts of stars that are long dead living proof that life is not confined to the form in which it is born. Last autumn, we sat together as the sun fell and the stars emerged. I told you that I wanted to be beautiful in the way that dusk is, an ever-changing collage of colors, always evading capture. 
You, you laughed and said you wanted to steal the stars so that you could embody their radiance, but you were already made from them. You were beautiful in the same way that the cosmos is, innumerable, unexplainable. And Grace, what I'm trying to tell you is that I don't know who you are because I'm not sure who I am, only who I'm not. Simply put, we are two people who are imperfect in the pursuit of ourselves. I don't need to pretend to have all the answers with you, though. The two of us can move from the floor to sit against the cinder brick wall of this classroom, clinging to one another, and let the silence consume the surrounding space. You can lay your head on my shoulder with a sigh, and I can rest my cheek atop its warmth. We can stay like this until our limbs go numb with disuse, television static prickling against our skin. And maybe here, we will find what we are searching for. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause, please. Mm -hmm. well done. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for sending your children here for two years. A special thank you to Scott Gould, Emily Chinquamon. Mm -hmm.